Welcome to the Michelle Meow Show at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm John Zipperer, the club's vice president of media and editorial, and Michelle's co-host for this program. We hope you're staying safe and are well wherever you are. There are reasons to look for an imminent end to this pandemic, and we look forward to seeing you in person and once again, when it is safe to do so, at the Commonwealth Club's headquarters in San Francisco. Until that time, we are doing all of our programming online. This is the latest in more than 430 online programs the club has produced since the beginning of the pandemic. You can find all of our upcoming programs, as well as podcasts and video from our past events at commonwealthclub.org. Now, if you're watching us live on YouTube, use the chat box to submit questions for our speaker today, and we'll work them into our program later. And now let me introduce Michelle Miao. She's a, the producer and host of the Michelle Miao Show and a member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors. Good to see you again, Michelle. John, thank you so much. And to hear you say that, you know, the end is almost near and there's a chance there's hope where we'll be together again in studio is incredibly exciting for me. I can't wait to see you in person. And all of you, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, stories such as today is one of plenty, many, I should say, that we are doing here uh, with the Commonwealth Club of California to raise the profile of AAPI voices. And so there is an entire page in which we've organized, and I hope that you take a take some time to go check it out at the Commonwealth Club's webpage. Um, so I must confess, I grew up working at a donut shop. I slept on those donut bags. I folded those pink boxes. My weekend started at three or four in the morning, and I remember the smell of fried dough and sweet glaze. Um, it's all too familiar, but those iconic pink boxes, I never, ever knew that it was all because of a Cambodian refugee, Ted Noy, who built a donut empire here in California. And now I know because I've watched the documentary, The Donut King. So we're excited to have the filmmaker and director with us, Alice Gu. Hi, Michelle. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, John. Um, so like I said, I'm really excited because I feel I feel like, you, you know, like the entire documentary told my childhood story and you filled in a lot of blanks for me. I mean, you know, I thought that uh, I knew that there were a lot of Cambodian Americans who owned donut shops, but I thought it was just kind of like the same thing as, you know, Vietnamese Americans who owned nail salons. Um, why don't we start with, you know, Ted and you becoming aware of Ted's story and how that kind of led to the documentary. So I was introduced to the story really by accident, but I was a new mother a couple of years ago and my husband had brought home from where we are in Los Angeles at one of these kind of upscale bakeries, brought home gourmet donuts and gourmet pastries and he offered a donut to our new nanny. And she said, oh no, I'm good, thank you. I only eat Cambodian donuts. And we're like, what? These are like the ones from Huckleberry that are like $6.50. These are the farm to table donuts, you know? And she says, no, 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 I only want Cambodian donuts. And this was a couple years ago, we were so busy. I didn't even have time to really engage in a conversation. It was like in and out as life used to be, right? And a couple days later, she said, I found a Cambodian donut shop. And I was like, God, she's still going on about these Cambodian donuts. I'm thinking, how did she find one? She's been here for a week and she doesn't have a car and doesn't drive. I've been here for seven years. Um, I was living in Santa Monica, California. It's not really known for being super diverse with all these little ethnic, you know, bakeries and shops. I'm like, where did she find a Cambodian donut? And then following day, she said, I brought home Cambodian donuts for you guys. And we can't wait to eat it. You know, I, I'm a self-professed foodie. I feel like I pride myself on tasting many different things from many different cultures. Why had I never heard of a Cambodian donut? I pull it out of the bag. I look at it and it's round in shape and it's shiny and has a hole in the middle. My husband and I, we both take like synchronized bites into the, into the donut and it actually, it was really fluffy and delicious. And we're like, okay, but this is like a, a ordinary glazed donut. And she says, no, it's a Cambodian donut. We're like, how on earth is this Cambodian? This tastes like every donut I've ever had. And she says, no, because Cambodian people make them. They're fresher, they're less sweet. They, you know, uh, they're fluffier. And I said, come on. I'm like, no, and she's, 
if a Cambodian person makes an American donut, it's still an American donut, which is actually kind of one of the questions that proved to be the heart of the film. And she said, no, it's a thing. And I said, I don't believe you, you know, and I decided to Google. She's like, look it up. And it was more for me to like, you know, I'm going to prove you wrong right now. And I Googled Cambodian donuts, Los Angeles. And all of these articles came up about Ted Noy, the Cambodian refugee turned donut mogul, turned millionaire, shook hands with four US presidents. I mean, all of the headlines alone were grabby enough for me. So I clicked on every single one and I was fascinated and amazed that something that's been right under my nose my entire life, I had no idea of the history at all, behind it all. There's, there's so much that's fascinating about him and his story. And now I've not seen the film, Michelle has, I've just seen the, the trailer that uh, Michelle had sent earlier, but um, just the, all the issues with immigration, the time and where he came from, you know, how the United States, what it offered him and how it reacted to him as well, of course, as his, his fascinating personal and professional life and all of this. Um, so kind of keeping it, I, or at least starting there at, at the beginning, this is how you, you, so you learned what a Cambodian donut is and you learned about him. How did you go about getting in touch with him? And when you did, was it at all difficult to getting him to talk about his life story? Well, all of the articles that I devoured, this was from, you know, in that Google search, there were LA Times articles from 1985, 1992, 2015, California Sunday Magazine. So I, I read every single one and I was fascinated. And according to one of those articles, it said that Ted Noy was responsible for the proliferation of why we have so many donut shops in California. And that there was an estimate that there are about 5,000 independent donut shops in the state of California and up to 90% of them are Cambodian owned. And also from the articles, I also found out that Ted Noy was now living in Cambodia. And I'm like, oh gosh, okay, how do I find this guy? He's like, he must be almost 80 years old who knows if he has any type of social media, like how am I going to find this guy? And then I figured, well, if the article is true, that he is the reason why there are so many donut shops and they'll have a connection, I must be able to just pick up the phone randomly, call a donut shop. And if not them, they must, somebody has to be able to point me in the right direction. So I did, I cold called DK's donuts in Santa Monica, which is kind of an institution in Santa Monica and really expecting to hear, I don't know, for anyone who's ever cold called, it's not very comfortable. <laughs> it's a little awkward. A lot of times they're not always successful. So, you know, I was mentally prepared for that, but the girl who picked up the phone at DK's Donuts had a chirpy young voice, really not what I was expecting to pick up the phone and perfectly American accent in English. And I said, oh gosh, you know, I'm, may not even have reached the right kind of place or business, but I, you know, give the little spiel. Hey, I'm Alice Gill, a filmmaker. I'm looking for Ted Noy. And she says, well, great. You've called the right place. I'm the right person. Ted is my great uncle. Are you on Facebook? I'll connect you. Wow. And we were Facebook messaging a day later. And two days later uh, on a Facebook audio call, I spoke to him for the first time. And it was a little, you know, a little bit, you know, when someone comes out of the blue, you don't know, especially in this day and age, can you trust them? What do they want from you? Is this actually a scam for money? You know, you just don't know these days. And he was just a little more surprised. He says, you want to tell my story? Are you sure you reached the right person? I'm, I'm not famous. What could anybody possibly want to, why would anybody want to hear my story? And I, I convinced him otherwise. And, and just briefly, you mentioned you, you called up DK's Donuts and the DK stands for, am I correct? Donut King? You know what? Actually, nobody knows what oh, DK really? stands for. There are a few DKs. So DKs, they were a little small chain in Southern California and Cambodians slowly started to take them over. Oh, okay. And I figured it, it's, you know, that it stood for, DKs. In fact, I asked um, DKs of Orange, which is owned by another extended family member, Adam Vaughn. 
And I said, hey, so what does DK stand for? And in my head, I'm thinking the answer is going to be Donut King. And he said, you know, I don't know. He's like, when we were kids, I thought it stood for Donkey Kong. <laughs> what? <laughs> but totally not the answer I was expecting. Uh, and then when I asked Maylee, she said she thought that it stood for maybe David and Kay or David and Kate. She thought it was, it may have been a, like a husband and wife venture way back in the day. Now you'll both think this is really funny or, or maybe, you know, what brought us all here, but the donut shop that I worked for when I was growing up is actually called Donut King. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh, so yeah. Alice, you would have had a lot easier time making this film if you had just called Michelle. Right. <laughs> Could you imagine? <laughs> no, but, but again, I had no idea, you know, about the whole Ted Noy story. Um, I, I really didn't know. So, you know, Alice, this documentary doesn't just tell Ted's story. I mean, it tell, tells Ted's family story and all the extended families he brought over, he sponsored as he built his donut empire, but also the evolution of the donut itself and its meaning to at least Californians. Um, and it tells also, you know, the story of immigration, a, an American dream, there are so many narratives in this story. It's packed just like a, a donut box. If you were to buy a dozen, um, kind of talk to us about, you know, did, did, was that how you saw the film when you were starting out or did it just kind of progress over time as you were uncovering more stories? It really progressed over time. You know, when, uh, again, those, that first Google search and I read those articles instantly, I was hooked by something, you know, and that was his life that I felt like had a very Shakespearean quality to it, the rise and the fall and the love story, you know, there's, there's so much in there. So really from the beginning, I was like, okay, you know, is, is this a straight bio pick type of documentary about Ted Noy? But as we started exploring more in the discovery and peeling back the layers of that onion and meeting characters like Maylee and Adam Vaughn and, you know, really this second generation, the legacy of what he's left behind as he's long retired from the donut business, but they continue on in these young, robust American born Cambodian American children. I thought I'd be so remiss to leave that story out. And as I dug further, you know, I, upon first glance, I think what connected me to the story in the first place is I'm Chinese American and there are some quite a few parallels you know, like my parents fled communist China, the communists were, were fleeing the Khmer Rouge, coming here to set up a better life. Of course, I think about all of my parents' sacrifice so that I could grow up a normal American girl and go to high school parties and attend college and, and all of that. So in telling that, I said, wow, this is actually a really personal story for me. And this is quite an important, you know, I think across the board Asian story, but my producer, Jose Nunez, who is Colombian, and he had to leave his home country of Colombia at the age of 12. He was from Cali. And if you're familiar with Narcos at all, I mean, that's Cali cartel. And when he was 12 years old, his mom said, okay, we're out of here because there's only one future for you if we stay in this city. Um, our attorney Farhad, who is Persian American, in my, even my editor, Carol, who is many generations here, but Italian, Carol Martori. I really, it's actually everyone's story. If you look back far enough, she said, look, my great, great grandparents, you can find their names in, in the book, Ellis Island. They came, they started with a produce cart in Manhattan. And, you know, everybody, if you trace back far enough, you've got these kinds of I don't know, big, humble beginnings in this country. I'm the great grandchild of, of immigrants from Germany. Um, and obviously immigration is today a very live, very, I mean, it's, it's almost probably always been controversial in the United States, certainly for the past 150 years, but it's been a particular political wedge issue uh, in recent years. Um, 
take us back to the mid seventies when uh, Ted Noy comes here and some interesting connections there with president Ford and California governor, Jerry Brown. So what that, sort of reception did he and his, his fellow Cambodian refugees face? I mean, we started this film not long after president Trump had taken office. And, you know, what we were hearing in the news every day was certainly one side, you know, of one opinion of immigrants and immigration and refugees. And God, I, you know, we were just, you know, me personally, I was just kind of sick into my stomach every day hearing that. And uncover it was Carol, my editor, who found President Ford's speech. And she said, oh my God, you've got to give this a listen. I listened, I still have goosebumps now thinking about the first time I heard that speech. I cried by myself sitting at my computer, listening to that speech to President Ford, a Republican president, this tremendous leadership and bravery for taking this very, you know, taking a stand for immigrants and American values that, oh God, I was like, why am I, what am I feeling? I think I'm feeling what I've been missing in present day America or politics. And then <laughs> the footage of Jerry Brown, who in California for me has been, God, long been seen as like the beacon of hope and morality and had been so grateful for Jerry Brown. So here's Jerry Brown in 1975 saying the complete opposite. He's like, no, we can't welcome these, these refugees here. We've got unemployment at an all time high in California. I'm very reluctant. And I'm like, my mind was actually pretty blown. And it, it actually changed me. I think forever, things are not so black and white and things you, you have to consider change growth, how things, how things are. So it, it really changed me. And I feel like for the better. I've been thinking about that just in the past couple of days. We recently put on our website a program we have coming up in about two weeks with President George W. Bush. And he's got a new book out specifically on his paintings and stories of immigrants and what they've contributed to the United States and how we've benefited from them and just how dramatically his own party has changed, not to mention the entire country and that sort of uh, controversy. Michelle? Yeah. It makes me wonder, you know, kind of while we're on this subject and the discussion of immigration, today's situation and global migration. And it was one of the questions I wanted to pose you know, just to hear your thoughts. Um, it's like we found the answer before a long time ago, as far as, uh, you know, reaching out and helping others whose whose country you know is has been obliterated we have unaccompanied minors at the border right now and all the discussion around it seems like it's this crisis at the same time my mind i'm like why can't we do what we did so you know a couple decades or ago and um you know open the camps back up and get the get people in homes get them sponsored it's just a thought I left there, but wanted to kind of hear your take uh, in, in touching on not everything is so black and white. Yeah, it's really, I mean, tricky is an understatement, right? That's, I mean, when, when we started this film again, there was, do you remember the migrant caravan from three -ish years ago, right? So there was that migrant caravan of thousands of people marching up from Central America and it was actually Jose who said, he said, God, he's like in that, like, what if, what if a Ted Noy was in that caravan, you know, the next Dona King, the person ironically who would be baking one of America's most iconic foods is in that caravan. And there's certainly, again, to like, to put yourself in their shoes just for a second, right. To think like, how bad must it be for you to walk with your children, you know, for anyone out there who's parents and just wants to, you know, not necessarily spoil their kid, but I think we all here when, when we come from some sort of privilege, we just want to provide the best we can for all of our kids. And really we just think about schools and activities and what can help them, you know, be robust little young individuals. And that's not even an option for a lot of these people. I mean, this is life or death or children who have to march with shoes or no shoes and 
no food or water. How bad must life be to have to make that decision? It's like, okay, we're going to walk 400 miles on foot or thousand miles on foot. So I think it's while it is a complicated issue to be like, all right, come on, come all for everybody. You have to think about it. It's, you know what I hope that the donut King film does is that it, it humanizes what a refugee is. If it's just on the news and you see the word that's a refugee, or if you hear a term that says the migrant caravan or border crisis, doesn't really humanize these people. I mean, occasionally you'll see the one of like, oh, these little girls and that will actually tug at someone's heartstrings. But I think we're kind of funny. I think we have to be, um, I don't know, kind of see, given like a personal connection to it to actually care and have, you know, want to want to do something actionable. I'm not sure if I totally answered the question, but it, it is certainly not black and white. It's it's so complex and it's so heated and controversial, as you said, John. Yeah, you absolutely did. And that's the point is humanizing us all in our experiences. So, yeah, thank you, John. Back to you. So tell our audience a bit of what they'll learn about uh, Ted Nye when he came to the United States. How did he come change? You know, he was f fighting the communist forces in, in Cambodia. He comes here. How does he get into business and how does how, how does he become the donut king? Well, you know, we, I think we've certainly heard in the news again, when it comes to immigration and work and taking jobs and whatnot, because that's what Jerry Brown's concern was back in the day. And that's still 50 years later is still what we hear. It's like, oh, they're going to take our jobs. There are a lot of jobs that kind of ordinary Americans don't really want to do. And that was certainly the case back then. Ted Noy he was willing to do whatever it takes. He was willing to work 24 hours around the clock. He took his first job scrubbing toilets as a custodian at the church who sponsored him. And he pumped gas at night as a gas station attendant. And then to further supplement his income, he worked at a building part, uh, building parts like a Home Depot, but it was called Builders Emporium back in the day. And he wasn't afraid of of the hard work. I'm not implying that other people are afraid of the hard work, but he just, it was hard work and grit and a determination to feed his family. He knew that he couldn't be here, not speaking the language. He couldn't just rest on his laurels. And he was so eternal, you know, grateful for this country that took him in, you know, and I was thinking that could also be a perspective thing too, right? Is, um, Hey, do you want to scrub toilets for 10 hours a day? And you're like, God, no, <laughs> I don't want to do that. Well, for these guys from Cambodia, it certainly beats the kind of labor that they were doing with a gun pointed at their head and for no pay. So anything outside of that is a step up. Of course, they're willing to do everything. They're willing to do whatever it takes. And, and gosh, save, 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 and work your way up. And and work, work his way up, he did. We hear later in the documentary, I, I don't want to give it all away, by the way, because you can watch the documentary right now. It's on Amazon. I um, think it's coming to YouTube. Where else is it available, Alice? It is on iTunes, Amazon Prime, Google Play. Um, it is on YouTube, actually. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, but it, it, we learned that, you know, T Ted uh, pretty much, he loses everything. We know that for sure. He loses it by gambling and loses his millions. I was telling John before um, this all started, our, our interview started that he at one point was making like a hundred thousand dollar net a month. <laughs> he was a millionaire in the early nineties, but he loses that all due to gambling and eventually loses his wife. And the final straw for, for them is really, you know, he, he cheated on her. Uh, you'll have to watch a documentary to hear their love story, which I cried. You know, the three times I watched the documentary, I cried listening and watching their love story. Um, but how did you get, you know, his ex-wife, Christy, and also the children to open up about what felt like a very painful and traumatic chapter in their life? It took 
a bit of time, uh, a lot of time, a lot of cajoling, a lot of persistence. There were a lot of, you know, first of all, it is, it is past trauma that is so hard to, to go back and open up. But I would say that also Asians, generally speaking, culturally are not really an open book and they don't really want to talk about dirty laundry. It's, it's really, especially just keep your head down, keep a low profile, don't draw attention to yourself. And it really took the help of a lot of the kids. So the kids who are born here, I don't know, it's a different American sensibility. It's about, it's a curiosity about wanting to know where you come from. It is an importance about preserving story and heritage. And a lot of the uh, older generation, it really took the help from the kids. They said, mom, dad, please do this for us. This is so important. Um, I, I know you don't totally understand, but please like your history, your stories are so important. If you don't share the stories, they will be forgotten. He, as we mentioned, so he, he eventually, he, he becomes a millionaire, has this, this business empire. It, it fails because of his gambling. Um, he goes back to Cambodia. He tries to get into politics that fizzled his marriage failed. Um, from his point of view, I mean, was one of those the most painful, was it the marriage or was it the loss of the business or his inability to be a, a political kingmaker in, in Cambodia? What, I guess I'm kind of asking what, what was his biggest failure or the, 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 the one that hurt the most? I would guess it would be losing the love of his life. Christy, who stuck by him through and through. Mm -hmm. She was his princess and she really was a princess. I mean, he came from the poorest of the poor, from a teeny tiny village in the countryside, literally with no shoes and sleeping on dirt floors and going to Phnom Penh and meeting Christy at the time, her Cambodian name was Sugantini. And she was beautiful and wealthy. And, you know, I'd heard, oh, you know, Christy came from a high ranking family. I, I later found out not only was it high ranking, her sister was the first lady of Cambodia for a period of a couple of weeks during the, the transition government. I mean, it's, he literally went from being a poor kid to marrying a princess. This is such a remarkable story. I like want you to keep talking. Just tell us all the stories. Um, do you keep in touch with the noise and and you know? I do. Yeah. I do. And all the. I think that we are lifelong friends at this point. Um, and speaking with, uh, got a funny, a, a, just a fun fact. Speaking with Evelyn, who is Christie's sister, the former first lady of Cambodia. I really wanted to recreate because there's, there's so much that was lost during the war. So as far as personal artifacts, pictures, you know, very little was preserved. And in order to tell the story visually, you know, I, I use the animation as, as you're familiar with Michelle. And I really wanted that to be as authentic as possible. And I went to Evelyn and I said, tell me, what did your villa look like? And she described it and I drew it for her. I said, you mean like this? And she said, okay, it was two stories like this. This jutted out. This was a carport. The dogs, the, you know, the dog was a Belgian Malinois. The cars, there was a, a Citroen de Cheval. They had a Jeep. They had a Nash convertible. I mean, it was so incredible to, it was so incredible to be able to hear that description. I mean, Christy, she's like, so, you know, really talk to Evelyn. She'll remember better than me. These were so long ago. It's actually kind of hard to describe, but anyway, we did the best we could. I yeah. love the uh, animations, by the way, and the original drawings that you included with the archival footage at the, in it, you know, at the time that you probably didn't have actual footage of what they were talking about. So you were the artist? Is that what I just heard? No, I was not the artist. I did, <laughs> I did pretty pathetic little sketches and then I would give it to the artist. So our artist was a Cambodian American artist. His name was Andrew Hem. And oh, I was so familiar, 
his art is incredible. And I was familiar with him through Instagram and he's got quite the following. And, you know, one day I, I cold DM'd him, you know, through another artist friend. And I mean, it, again, like cold calling, this is also not, kind of not the call you want. Hey, do you want to do a lot of work for not a lot of money? I mean, it's a documentary. So um, this is what it's about. And he wrote back to my surprise, hey, Alice, um, I'm totally interested. I'm actually familiar with Ted Noy. My family knew him. I'm a donut kid. This was the only job I ever knew before I went to Art Center and became an artist. And I was like, no way. I can't, I can't believe it. It just all kind of synergistically perfectly came together. Gosh, so many of us um, actually worked at the donut shops and that's how <laughs> we grew up. One last question before we turn it back to John, because we're on this track. Um, I'm super impressed by the archival footage. And so wondering how you were able to get access to some of that footage that you know, get, talking about a war that not a lot of people want to talk about, super traumatic, the Khmer Rouge um, genocide. And then, uh, and then if you actually traveled to Cambodia for the film. Yeah, we worked with a couple of incredible researchers, um, uh, Jane and Kate Co. They were able to God, go through their resources and just find these huge troves of, of archival footage that uh, we, we just kind of couldn't believe what all the stuff that we had to work with, all the footage we had to work with. Um, and Carol and Ramel and Rob, our editing team just did a tremendous job of really finding what worked best for us. And we did, uh, you know, match cuts between speaking of, yes, I did go to Cambodia um, a couple of times and one really powerful one was going to the genocide museum and, and going there and seeing those old rusted tanks and shooting them at, shooting them, filming them and seeing how they were now in these jungles and these old minefields, you really feel the weight of it all when you're there in person. And so I wanted to, you know, I, I shot the tanks in a certain way and Carol could find an archival shot that would match, you know, we would start on the rusted one and then she would go into an archival shot of a black and white shot of, you know, the, the same tank. So she's, she was really quite the maestro in kind of melding those worlds together. Amazing. You're talking a bit about the, the, this artist who is a, a donut child, he said, um, and he just kind of makes me think, I mean, his, Ted Noy's, his tone at Empire failed, um, but in a, in a bigger sense and maybe in a much more important sense, I mean, he succeeded in the sense that he, uh, so many people he tried to help were helped, you know, who, who got their start in the U.S., who became their own business people, who's, who were able to raise their kids so they could go on to college and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's, I mean, that's a tremendous legacy. Do you see his life story then as a story of hope or failure or success or, or how do you, how do you kind of position that? I really do. Um, and it wouldn't just be because of wealth, you know, because he certainly had lost um, a staggering amount of wealth at a period in his life. But now if you to meet him and talk to him at 80 years old, 81 years old, he really is at peace. I feel like he's really like reflecting on the life and God, this again, Shakespearean wildlife that he's had. He's found love. He found fame. He found wonderful, like love from his children. And, you know, I'll actually say, you know, I, for people who watch the film, a couple of his kids in the film, you could tell that they were a bit, resentful, you know, for many things. Um, the older kids in particular were resentful of a rob childhood that instead of watching cartoons and being able to play that they were at the donut shops very early in the morning, folding the boxes, pouring the coffee, counting money. They were resentful of that. They were resentful of dad cheating on mom. They were resentful of the house foreclosing. They were resentful of 
losing the fortune. And when we started filming, they really hadn't spoken. They're like, you know, like he's just kind of in Cambodia. We just want to take care of our mom, really. Like we just really don't want a whole lot to do with them. But I think that in making this film, it was very healing. You know, a lot of the old wounds that, yeah, I made them open up some old traumas and talk about them, but maybe these are feelings that hadn't been processed in decades. And I made them go, I'm like, go and find, they're like, we can't find it. I'm like, I know it's there. Go in your attic, open the box, find your yearbook, find your photos, find home video, find everything. And it's kind of like, okay, she's making us do this. And when you kind of go and you look at these pictures and memories come back and um, he has a good relationship with his kids now. Yeah. They, I feel like it has come to a place of, again, of forgiveness and understanding. Maybe a case where it's like, okay, maybe he did, understanding that he did the best he could under these circumstances. Um, so I, yeah, I feel like his, his life is a story of hope and success. That's really beautiful. It's really good to hear that the family is in contact um, again. And, and then obviously the second generation of uh, family members who've taken it on, some of them are doing extremely well, like May Lee and DK Donuts and, you know, being able to do different things with social media and um, the Cronut <laughs> I remember going crazy, you know, when the, the Krona came out, especially here in the Bay Area. Um, uh, but you, one part of the film that I can relate to, and it was in, it was very painful. You said it earlier, you know, Asians are not uh, necessarily an open book. Um, but I really appreciate Ted and his family telling the story of even his failures and gambling and, and addiction to gambling and how it affects the Asian community, the immigrant community. Uh, have you gotten any you know, feedback? Because I know that's kind of like a thing where we just don't talk about it. I wanna go and show this documentary to a lot of people just because I think we should talk about it. But curious to hear if Asian families have reached out to you to say, you know what, thank you for removing the cover from this thing that affects us. Asians and gambling. I mean, if you're Asian, if you know, you know, it's, it is a thing, particularly among Asian men. And there was an interview with a gambling psychologist that did not make it into the film, unfortunately, but I really wanted to understand the psychology. And even then, you know, it's, he dealt with patients of gambling addiction for years and years. And even then it's a little hard to pinpoint. However, there are a couple of, there are a couple of, kind of hypotheses that, that really made sense to me. And one is that a lot of Asians culturally come from some trauma, war, you know, certainly that's Koreans, Japanese, it's Chinese people, it's Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia. I mean, there's just, there's a lot of trauma. And he said that gambling actually makes a lot of sense for people who come from trauma, because if they climb out of that and start to have some success, that actually success and everything being calm and, and good actually is out of their comfort zone. It actually feel their comfort zone is to be in that state of chaos and fight or flight. So it is an unconscious way of self-sabotage to get back to a place of chaos. And I thought that was really interesting. Another one is, is that the casinos for foreigners can really are such a welcoming place because it's full of your friends and it's all fake friends, but they all feel like your friends. They come and say, Oh, Hey, Mr. Noy, welcome back. We know you love prime rib here. Here's eight coupons for dinner here's tickets to the fight. And for a lot of the people in these communities, they come here. I mean, Ted, after leaving Asia was married to a family who again, whose sister-in-law was once the first lady and coming here scrubs toilets and pumps gas. 
And although he did gain some wealth, it's not really a feeling of psychological good standing in society. But at the casino, you can feel like the big man on campus and people really respect you. People really love you. So it's that feeling that they're going after. And the casinos know this too. So they're chasing that with and making you feel really good with comp drinks. Um, I have had people reach out uh, certainly relating to the gambling in their own families. Um, gosh, I don't, I can't say that I have a solution for that. It's, it's an unfortunate and tragic part of a lot of Asian communities. Definitely. You know, the solution part, totally understand, but putting the film out there, I think is, is part of the solution. John. Uh, Ridley Scott was, uh, he executive produced the Donut King. How did that come about and what was his role as executive producer? We, uh, so Jose had been working with under, Jose and I both came from the world of commercials and Jose had produced um, a great deal at Ridley's commercial arm, the company called RSA. Uh, we were both mutual friends with one of the executive producers at Scott Free. And what's really tremendous is that, you know, we're making this film and God, dreams do come true. You know, I remember Jose said, wouldn't it be really cool if Scott Free came on? We're like, God, that'd be so cool. But okay. You know, we and we pitched Tom Moran and he said, All right, well, this sounds cool. He's like, I gotta tell you, um, you know, documentaries aren't something that we really do. We actually closed our documentary arm and and also this isn't something that we do. We don't come in at the end. We develop projects from, you know, from the very beginning. So he's like, but just, you know, send me all the materials you have anyway. And, you know, I'll take a look. And he took a look and he's like, okay, I'm in. He's like, this is incredible. This story needs to be told. And he went to the head of business affairs, you know, and the COO of Scott Free and said, look, you guys, if we don't, if we're not involved with this project, he's like, we're stupid. He's like, this is the most incredible story. And it ultimately then got to Ridley, who I will admit at the beginning, they said, okay, this is great. We're on, you can't use Ridley's name. And I'm like, oh, okay. And maybe a week later, I get a call from Jose and he's like, hey, Scott Free, they, they want a couple more credits. I'm like, God, how many they, they, didn't they want? aren't we already giving them like two credits? They want more. I'm like, what is wrong with them? And Jose is like, it's for Ridley. And I was like, no way. And he's like, Ridley saw it for a while. It's all that he could talk about. Oh. Um, he really, really connected with it. You know, obviously Ridley's not a refugee, but he's like, look, this reminds me of me and my brother. He's like, we came to LA. We knew nobody. We built ourselves from the ground up. Like, it just takes that determination, the grit, the hard work, and you can build your dreams. I know that may sound a little simplistic, but oh my God, I know I do. I don't know. It, it, the world is not so black and white. I'd like to say that it's all hard work and grit, but I know that's not always the case. I think it's it's uh, aligned with the Donut King and the American dream, right? Like, you know, taking chances, going out there, putting stuff out there. And sometimes things happen, good yeah. things. Um, the music, I wanted to talk about the music because it's so diverse. You know, you've got a little bit of hip hop in there. You also have some original music and also some, um, I think it's Cambodian music or mm -hmm. some, something. Yeah, right? Yep. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about the music and compiling that. Well, um, I had incredible music supervisors, Liza Richardson and Dan Wilcox. I knew, well, donuts are fun, right? So for, I, and I wanted this film to always be a bit of a Trojan horse from the beginning. So if somebody is flipping through their queue, like, oh, here's a pink poster. This looks friendly. And and 96% of Americans claim to love donuts. The Donut King, the title is fun. And, and donuts are associated with kitsch, right? And Homer Simpson and sprinkles and pop culture. 
Cool. Let's find, let's find donut tracks, donut songs. And most of them are hip hop, which I thought was appropriate and great because that is certainly what's pop now. Um, and God, I, they did, <laughs> they did an incredible search. I had no idea. There were so many donut tracks that sound like they were made for the film. Um, I can tell you a story. We start the film with Wu-Tang Clan, which is our about 40 seconds into the film. And our assistant editor put in temp music, you know, as we do until we get the, the real music in there. And he temped in cream, which I was like, oh my God, this is the song. We've got the double entendre, we've got cream. This is about the hustle, making money. This is absolute, like this is a non-negotiable. And I know we were a documentary. I mean, this stuff, these, these tracks cost a lot of money. And <laughs> I called Jose, I called Liza, the music supervisor, and I was like, you guys, don't kill me. And they're like, oh, great. What now? <laughs> <laughs> and <clears throat> I need, I need Wu-Tang Clan. I need cream. And they're like, oh God. And you know what? Actually hip hop is notoriously hard to clear because there's so many samples for, you know, to be nerd out on the music side, there's so many samples. There's so many people there's publishing. There's, it's just, it's so hard. Um, and she said, okay, well, we'll do our best, but you know, this is like one of their biggest hits. This is like hundreds, hundreds of thousands of dollars usually. And, um, anyway, I was like, okay, I'm resourceful and I know people and I call friends and I said, okay, somebody's got to know somebody who knows somebody who knows Wu-Tang Clan. I reached a friend of mine who says, Hey, this is the best I can do. And she gave me this 818 phone number, this mysterious phone number. And one day I, I called that number <laughs> and she said, okay, well, um, write me a letter or, you know, I should, I said, Hey, can I have a, they call them a passion letter. And I wrote a letter to Riza, you know, why I love the track and everything looks good. And, and Liza said, Hey, God, it looks like your letter worked there. Looks like they, they want to play ball for like very little, like almost no money. And I was like, Oh my God, this is incredible. And then it, but the song still wasn't clearing and we were getting close to our South by Southwest premiere date, which, you know, ultimately ended up getting canceled. But, um, about a week before, um, Liza asked me, she said, Hey, do you want to, she's like, I'm actually getting nervous. Um, do you want to consider some alts? And I said, no, <laughs> because I'm like, no, not at all. And she said, okay, well we have to. And I said, no. And I called the 818 number again and she picked up and I said, Hey, it's me from like four or five months ago. Do you remember me? And basically what had happened is, is Rizzo will say hi, but his brother who controls the publishing says no. And if he says no, that that's it. And when I talked to the 818 number, I said, well, let me say, I'm you know, he's just really drawing a hard line. He's saying no to everything. We're in negotiations for a lot of other things. And if we say yes to you, this sets a bad precedent for all of our other negotiations. I was like, oh, geez. I'm like, okay, but can I send you another letter? <laughs> and I sent another letter. And she's like, I'll give it to him. You know, I have no idea if these letters even go to him. And she said, yeah, I'm just like, and by the way, and just to like, just for some context, she named one and she's like, this person, you know, his lifelong friend. And I said, yeah, she said, he said no to her. And I was like, oh, oh God. She's like, just so you know, it's, it's not personal. She's like, they're all, everyone's pretty upset right now, but he's just saying no to any, everything, unless it's top dollar. And I wrote another passion letter at 11 PM. I sent another, I was like, oh God. Okay. In addendum, here's another letter. I'm like, I'm going to write him again. The next morning, the track was cleared and I could not believe it. And Woo Music wrote, and they said, we're so happy to do it. And it is because we have a partner for the film and it's Refugees International. And I wrote about why the song means so much to me 
why the song is perfect for the film, what the film represents to me, and that we partnered with Refugees International and that a percentage of proceeds will go to them because we felt like it was the right thing to do. And they wrote back and they said that that really resonated with them. And that's why they were happy to clear the track. Great. Has Ted Noy seen the finished film? And if so, do you know what his reaction is? He has seen the film and he is really proud of it. He's, he's very happy. The family is happy, you know, thank God. So that's actually my toughest audience is the family themselves. And so I feel very honored that they, they feel like I did a good job representing their family. Yeah. I'm still like teary eyed from hearing the story of the uh, <laughs> song, like, wow. Oh my gosh. Wow. Uh, hearing the backstory, putting this all together. I know that you're super busy and you're working on a bunch of stuff. Um, I don't know if it's appropriate to ask, but as we're winding down, is it okay to ask what's next? What, when's, what's the next Alice Wu film? Um, God, I have... Alice Wu, I'm sorry. It's okay. I have um, a couple of irons in the fire. One is um, a, well... Fingers crossed, right? One is about a, it's a film about a real Japanese wrestler um, who came to America, inducted into the Wrestling Hall of Fame just a couple of years ago. So fingers crossed that successful in getting that script written and turned into a feature. Um, one is, I have a documentary about a Spanish chef. Um, I have a scripted feature about um, high school students. It's a high school script, young adult audience. And there is one that I, there's a project I've been chasing for 10 months. So I don't want to jinx it. It's, it, it's like right at the tip of my fingertips and I'm hoping it'll happen, but that one, it, it's a very cool one. And also it's about things you never knew about something like right under your nose the entire time. Uh, and now just hearing, you know, you and talking about what it takes to get a film together and tell somebody's story, there's so much appreciation for it, but um, also for you and the Donut King. John? I guess I kind of want to take us full circle back to just the big topic of immigration and actually take Ted Noy out of the, the and really just talk about kind of what he was able to accomplish there and just how how different it is from the way that so many countries, I mean, all around the world, all different cultures, all different societies, everything deal with, with refugees is often, you know, put them in a, in a camp, um, prevent them from working in many cases. Um, and of course, put all, just all kinds of restrictions on them. Whereas it would seem so much a, a better option to say, okay, you're here. We, you know, here are the rungs onto the ladder of, of, of starting a business or, or getting into a business and then working your way up. Um, because as we've mentioned here and as we mentioned elsewhere, I mean, these are people who are, who have made the biggest change in their lives as possible, you know, sometimes traveling halfway around the world and they're looking to work hard and do stuff. Um, I mean, wouldn't both immigrants and countries be better off if, they were looked at as, you know, resource, not, and I don't mean like natural resource, but I mean, as a valuable resource, human resource to a, to a culture and an economy, then we're, as, as they tend to be looked at as a burden or even a threat. Um, yes. And actually it is, I don't have it in front of me. Um, and I wish I did. We will be in May, the film will be available on PBS through their independent lens program. And this was very important for me, for the film to be available to a wide audience for free. And, and uh, anyway, ITBS, PBS, they've been such incredible partners and we are doing, before our release, they're called indie pop-ups and they kind of engage local communities and they do a really good job of targeting, you know, who it's gonna be. And they put together these discussion guides I mean, they're really meant to be intimate affairs and a lot of thought, you know, thought and discussion going in after. And in the discussion guide, I mean, they went deep in all of their research. And again, I don't have it in front of me, but the statistics are 
It's actually the contrary is true to we think, oh, they're going to take our jobs and it's going to be worse. They actually add to the economy and I can't give you the exact percentage, but I was actually really, I was like, oh my God, you actually found that statistic. It's actually true that they are a resource. It is not the opposite that they are taking away from our economy. They actually add to the economy. Um, and I feel like that could be, I can, that could be better communicated. Um, cause that's certainly not kind of the going narrative. Well, I certainly think the Donut King is a uh, part of that, you know, narrative or the effort to get out there, how important we are, how, uh, we are considered as resources, um, refugees, immigrants. So I thank you for the Donut King. And I thank you, Alice, uh, for being a voice out there, especially during these very uh, challenging and intense times for Asians and Asians, American, Asian Americans. Thanks so much for being here with us on the Commonwealth Club. And thank you for joining us, John. I'll just wrap it all up by sharing my thanks as well to Alice Gu and to everyone watching and listening to us online. You can find more at commonwealthclub.org slash MMS. Have a good rest of your week and a good weekend.